Ladies and gentlemen, many British subjects, leading members of the theatrical and musical professions, are at present in the United States. The distinguished English actress, Miss Gertrude Lawrence, has gathered a number of them together for a welcome and farewell to their sovereigns. Here is Miss Lawrence. It is with much pride that we English men and women connected with the theater in America and the screen in Hollywood offer today contributions to our beloved king and queen. And our fervent hope is that we may add, if only a little, to a visit that must be forever a permanent memory of happiness. And now, Your Majesties, a few words from young Mr. Freddy Bartholomew. Your Majesties, I feel both highly honored and deeply grateful that I should have been chosen for the privilege of extending to you a welcome and the good wishes of your younger subjects, now resident in the United States. Together with our fathers, mothers, and relatives, we have looked forward to your visit with great anticipation ever since Your Majesty's intentions were first announced. We all felt sure that your coming would first serve to further cement the already happy relations existing between this great country and our motherland. We were confident, too, that when you returned home after your visit, you would take back with you countless memories of the same kindness, generosity, and hospitality of the American people that we, your subjects, have known and enjoyed in living here. We have, however, one suggestion to make, and, and I hope I may be forgiven for expressing it, but, well, really, it would have been so much nicer if our Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose could have come with you. After all, when the United States government sent its ambassador to Your Majesty's court recently, he took ever so many of his children along as assistant ambassadors of American goodwill. So please, won't you come back again soon and bring our princesses with you? I'm sure if you do, all America will learn to love them as we, your faithful subjects, do. The one and only Cecilia Loftus, through her amazing talent of impersonation, will bring you two old friends, Albert Chevalier and Mary Lloyd, singing two old favorites. I will present my own character sketch of a London flower girl. Violets, violets, duck as a bunch, violets. Only duck as a bunch, violets. Believe yourself, I'll let you have them for a penny. I can't do no more than that. Oh, Lord. Not even a penny for a bunch of poor little violets. What a life. Oh, hello, Emma, dear. However are you? Why didn't you know, my dear? This is the day their majesties, the king and queen, God bless them, is listening to that big broadcast over in America. I thought business would be better today, but now luck. <laughs> Must be hard work being kings and queens and having to be royal all the time. I couldn't do it. But I suppose they get used to it like anything else, poor dears. Oh, Emma, things is very different from what they used to be. Remember the days of the good old English musicals and the songs they used to sing? Mary Loftus and Mary Lloyd and all that lot? Ah, them was the days. Marie Loftus. She was writing his name on the sand. She was writing his name on the sand. And while she was writing his name on the sand, she was writing his name on the sand. <laughs> And Mary Lloyd. Oh, I can't forget the days when I was young. Oh, it don't seem so very long ago. I had sweethearts by the score, and I've time for plenty more. But I can't forget the days when I was young. And dear old Albert Chevalier, singing my old Dutch. We've been together now for 40 years And it don't seem a day too much Oh, there ain't a lady living in the land As I'd swap 
for me, dear old da- It's kind of pathetic, ain't it, Emma? That I'm a lady living in the land As I'd swap for me, dear old Violets, tops a bunch, violets Only tops a bunch, violets Wish I could throw a bunch to their majesties at Hyde Park. God bless them. Miss Anna Nagel appears in a scene from her magnificent characterization of Queen Victoria, with George Sanders playing the role of Prince Consort. The scene is the honeymoon castle. Miss Anna Nagel. Will you, Albert, take Victoria to be your lawful wedded wife, to love, honor, cherish until death do you part? I will. Will you, Victoria, take Albert to be your lawful wedded husband to love, honor, and obey until death do you part? I will. Windsor Castle. How gray it looks in the sunlight. And how beautiful. Almost as beautiful as you are. Dear Albert... What would you call this in English? This uh, going away after a wedding? A honeymoon. Honeymoon. <laughs> That's nice. And in German? Flitterwochen. Flitterwochen. I like that. You must go down in history as the queen who spent the longest Flitterwochen. My dear, you forget. After all, I am the queen. Business cannot stop and wait for anything. Parliament is sitting, and every day I am needed for something. Why, even two days is a long time to be away. Two days? Oh, must we go back so soon? Yes, I have to return, especially to discuss with Sir Robert Peel a new tax. Oh, what does he call this new tax? He calls it the income tax. You know, I fear it is not going to be very popular. Oh, yes, that is a very interesting experiment. We have in Coburg a professor of this new political economy who has written a long work on the subject. I read it with great interest and myself wrote him a commentary on it. This evening I will explain it to you. No, my dearest, this evening, music. No, Victoria, first work and then play. Music, dearest? No, Victoria. But, Albert, I wish never to discuss with you anything so dull as politics. We will have music. Oh, There? The Queen. We have retired. Who's there? Victoria. Who's there? Your wife, Albert. Victoria. <laughs> Mr. Reginald Gardner has joined forces with Mr. Roland Young and Mr. David Niven in a discussion of Hollywood and how your majesty would be received were you ever to visit that fabulous city. We find them driving aimlessly about with Ronald Young, the Hollywood guide extraordinary. This is Beverly Hills. Well, who lives here? Oh, the stars, practically all of them. Except those who live on ranches. Well, which ones live on ranches? Well, practically all of them. Well, who lives in this block? A fellow by the name of... I forget. Oh, yes, yes, Ronald Coleman is in this block. Well, which house? I don't know, boy, he moved. I say, look over there. Isn't that Greta Garbo coming out of that house? I don't think so. She never comes out. Uh, seen enough? Well, I haven't seen anything yet. You can see Catalina on a clear day sometimes. I thought she was in New York. Oh, Catalina Hepburn. Oh, steady, old man. <laughs> well, who lives in that house? Chapman. Charles Chaplin? No, no, boy, Phil Chapman, fine chap, great friends of mine. Well, what does he do in pictures? Nothing I know of. Just something rather big in trucks, I think. Now, Roland, old man, there must be someone you know in pictures. Think. Yeah, let's see. Of course I do. Well, who is it? No, no, wait a minute. Why, it's, um... Is it Clark Gable? No, no. Uh, Betty Davis. She's wonderful. Yes, me. Well, do you know her? No. Well, is it Tyrone Power? No. no I've got it. It's Sid Grauman. Sid Grauman? Who's he? You know, Grauman's Chinese. Oh, is he? No, 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 boy. Not is, has. Now, listen, I came out here to visit you because you're in pictures. You've lived here for nearly ten years, and I'd like to see some picture stars. Oh, really? Who would you like to see? 
Well, I don't know. You're the one who ought to know. I do know one, but he's on his yacht. And you're going back tomorrow. No, I am not. Oh, please do, over. Well, you, you don't know anything. You're a fine ambassador for your country. You wouldn't be able to point out one single star. Do you know Carol Lombard? No. Does she live there? No. Well, then how do you know she doesn't live there? Because that's my house. Wait a minute. Here, here's David Niven. I want to talk to him. Oh, hello, David. Hello, Roland. How are you, old boy? Fine. You going to the Rathbone party tomorrow night? Yes, are you? Yes. I may be a bit late. Busy day tomorrow. Playing tennis with Richard Bartle, Miss Cocktails with Herbert Marshall, dinner at Loretta Young. Who do you think will be at the Rathbone party? Oh, everybody in Hollywood. Do you think the Rathbones will be there? I think so, yeah. Oh, that's good. I'll go. Well, goodbye. Bye, boy. That, that, was, Ronald, that was Ronald Coleman. Oh, no. Steady, old man. It was David Niven, surely. Why didn't you introduce me? I don't know him. You wanted me to star. There's, one, there's someone now on that terrace. Now, if I could see her face, I'd know who it was. Well, who is it? I think it's... Well, I'll drive in. Oh, 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 you're driving. Roland, who was it? I don't know, boy. Well, it wasn't who I thought it was. We continue with Sir Adrian Bolt conducting an NBC Symphony Orchestra in Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance, March number two. Now we come to Miss Greer Garson and Mr. Leslie Howard in a scene from Goodbye, Mr. Chips by James Hilton. The absence of my good friend, Mr. Robert Donut, in England is your loss, but my happy gain. For it gives me this enviable opportunity of serving in his stead. In recreating the role which he did so admirably in the motion picture Goodbye, Mr. Chips, it's also my added good fortune to play opposite Miss Greer Garson, whose characterization of Cathy ranks as one of the outstanding performances of the year. I leave it to Miss Lawrence to set the scene. Mr. Chipping was 24 when he went to Brookfield School, filled with the high hopes and brave ambitions of youth. Someday, perhaps, he might be headmaster. But at 40, he was disillusioned, the marks of it plain upon his face. Lower school prep had done that to him. The boys were terrors. He wanted friendships. There were none, except one, 
the kindly German master Herr Stiepel by name. It was he who insisted that Mr. Chipping should go walking with him through the Tyrol, that memorable summer vacation. There, high on a mountainside, enveloped in a mist, Mr. Chipping found his great adventure. It is now my privilege to introduce Mr. Leslie Howard as Mr. Chipping and Miss Greer Garson, an English actress of whom we are all very proud, a charming newcomer to Hollywood as Kathy. This is a nice business. I could be here all night. Hello? 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 Good heavens, it's a woman. Hello? Hello? Are you in danger? Hello? Hello. Why, I, 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 I can't see you. Where are you? Here I am. Oh, there you are. Uh, are you all right? Yes, quite, thank. The mist's a nuisance, isn't it? You uh, aren't in any danger? No. Do you mind? Uh, no, 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 of course not. You shouldn't be moving about, you know. It's awfully foolish of you. Foolish? I, I, I heard you call. I thought you were in some difficulty. Oh, don't tell me you climbed up here to rescue me. As a matter of fact, I did. Oh. Now, really, I should be very angry with you. Supposing you'd fallen. Well, I must say, I... I never I, I... heard of such utter stupidity. Where were you? On the ledge below. And you climbed up in that mist to rescue me when I'm probably a better climber than you are. Well, then, what were you screaming about? Oh, I wasn't screaming. I, I... Well, I just let out a shout at random. Oh, so that was why. Really, it was idiotic of you. And rather wonderful. Not at all. Well, anyhow, I'm awfully glad you came. It was going to be very lonely here. Won't you sit down? This is quite comfortable, <laughs> as rocks go. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> my, my name's Chipping. Mine's Ellis. Catherine Ellis. Won't you have a sandwich? I've got loads of them. This one is uh, ham. Oh, well, thanks. I, uh, <laughs> I ate mine early. I, I am hungry. I'm sorry I wasn't in any danger. <laughs> well, it, it was rather inconsiderate of you. What are you doing alone on a mountain? Isn't it rather unusual for young ladies? I'm not usually alone. I have a friend at the inn. So have I. We're on a walking tour. Really? We're bicycling. Bicycling? To Austria? Mm-hmm. Good heavens. I didn't know ladies rode those awful things. I'm afraid so. What do you mean with, with one leg on each side of the saddle? Well, you don't imagine I ride side saddle, do you? What, what, what happens to your, to your dress? Oh, they breed female bicycles now, didn't you know? Ladies riding bicycles. I, I don't approve all this rushing about on wheels. Do you know, the other day a man passed me in a cloud of dust. A cloud of dust. He must have been doing 15 miles an hour. Human beings were never intended to go that speed. I suppose you think I, I'm old-fashioned. I like men to be old-fashioned. Will you have another sandwich? Uh, you're sure you... Thank you. We'll reserve the rest for emergencies. Oh, it's chilly, isn't it? Oh, I say, I should have thought of it. Here, here, take my coat. I, I'm rather too warm. I wouldn't think of it. Put it on again at once. No, 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 really. No, you must take it. I insist. Please. Well, look here. Why don't we share it? It's big enough for both of us. Good heavens, no. So, someone might see us. <laughs> on this mountain? What if they did? No, I don't need it, really. Well, I, I insist. Look, like this. Here, here, catch hold of it. There, that's right. A penny for your thoughts. Well, as a as, as matter of fact, I was thinking of you. Kindly, I hope. I see very little of ladies at Brookfield. I was rather realizing what I'd missed. If I may say so, Mr. Chipping, I think the ladies have missed a great deal, too. Well, that's very kind of you, but I, I'm not really a ladies' man. Afraid of them? Terrified. <laughs> not of me, I hope. <laughs> not up here in the clouds. Perhaps the altitude's gone to my head. But if I had met you at the inn... Because I'm a strong-minded female who rides a bicycle and wants the boat. No, 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 no. On the contrary. Because... Because... Well, because you're so very nice looking, I think, and charming. And so are you, Mr. Chipping, frankly. Oh, oh good heavens, no one's ever called me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what extraordinary ideas come into one's head up here. It's the altitude. Do you, do you experience a sort of exhilaration? Definitely. As though we own the mountain? Do put it mildly. We're, we're, we're pretty superior persons. We're gods. Up here, there's no time, no growing old. 
Nothing lost. We're young. We believe in ourselves. We face in the future. <sighs> it must be the altitude. Oh. <laughs> uh, tell me, um, do you suppose that a person in, in middle age could start life over again and make a go of it? I'm sure of it. Quite sure. It must be tremendously interesting to be a schoolmaster. Yes, I, I thought so once. To watch boys grow up and help them along and see their characters develop and what they become when they leave school and the world gets hold of them. I don't see how you could ever get old in a world that's always young. No, I never really thought of it that way. But you know, when you talk about it, you make it sound rather exciting and heroic. Oh, it is. And the schoolmaster, is, is he exciting and heroic too? I've met only one. A reckless person who climbed the Glockner in a mist to... Why, what is it? There's a light on your face. A strange light. Oh, look. The mist has lifted. Yes. Yes, so it has. Well, we, uh, we can go down now. Yes. I'm almost sorry. Well, it was an adventure, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, well, back to reality. I wonder if we're not leaving it behind us. Mr. Dennis King singing Annie Laurie as a great to treat to us all, as always. Now for your especial favor, Your Majesties, the stirring once more unto the breach from Henry V, spoken by Mr. Laurence Olivier. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more I'll close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing more becomes a man than modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then lend the eye your terrible aspects, let it pry through the portage of the head like a brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth the galled rock or hang and judge his confounded face swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. 
Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. All, all you noblest English whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof. Fathers that like so many Alexanders have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mother. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of growth of blood and teach them how to war. Let you good yeomen whose limbs were made in England show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is not one of you that is so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, training upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for hell! A story for you now in the characteristic manner of the popular Scotchman, Will Fife. I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow town. <laughs> you know, this program wouldn't be complete without a representative of that wee bit of heather-covered land, Scotland. Today is the day. We're doing something for a great occasion, the visit of our king and queen to your country. True, as they were nearing these shores, the reception was a wee bit cold, owing to the icebergs they encountered. But the warmth of their reception in America would melt all the icebergs in the Atlantic. Well, here I am, a Scotchman in Hollywood. They tell me it's a wonderful place. I hope to see it one of these days. You see, I only go from the hotel to the studio and from the studio to the bank and then back to the hotel again. <laughs> you know, they tell a lot of stories against we Scotch people about our generosity. But all those stories are wrong. A Scotchman spends as much of his own money as anybody else spends of it for him. Here, was it not a Scotchman who gave the biggest prize in the history of sport? Do you remember that? He offered $20,000 to the first man that could swim the Atlantic? Underwater? <laughs> eh? Well, there's one thing you must admire about we Scotch people. We don't mind a joke against ourselves. It doesn't cost us anything, so we don't bother about it. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. Just before I came on the air, Ronald Coleman gave me a cigarette. It was one of these cork-tipped things. <coughs> They're terrible. As soon as the cork starts to burn, it seems to upset my throat somehow. <laughs> you know, I like a cigar best, don't you? You know, the best cigar I ever had in my life was given to me ten years ago by the mayor of Los Angeles. It was a Corona Corona. Uh, it was a beauty. I sometimes bring it out now on a Sunday and have a puff at it. <laughs> I remember once a Scotch friend of mine, McGregor, he was invited by an Englishman to spend a week with him in London. When he was leaving, the Scotchman says, You've treated me wonderful. When I get back to Scotland to my farm... I'm going to send you a chicken at Christmas time. Well, the chicken didn't arrive. The next time they met in London, the Englishman said to McGregor, uh, By the by, McGregor, old oh, fellow, you, uh, you didn't send me that chicken you promised me. Oh, said McGregor, did you not hear about it? It got better. <laughs> now, you know, you take a trip to Scotland, you'll find these stories are all wrong. Well, it'll not be long before I'm sailing home to Bonnie, Scotland again, and if I can raise the fare, I may return again to Hollywood. Good luck to you all, good health, and the grateful thanks of a loyal Scot for America's real American welcome to our King and Queen. Miss Edna Best and Miss Heather Thatcher recreate a scene from Alice in Wonderland. This is the scene where little Alice suddenly discovers that she's been made a queen. Seated about her on the small, squared, checkered grass appear before her the Red Queen and the White Queen. Please, would you tell me? Speak when you're spoken to. Oh, but if everybody obeyed that rule, if you only spoke when you're spoken to, and the other person always waited for you to begin, you see, nobody would ever say anything, so that... Ridiculous! Oh, but I didn't mean to... A nasty, vicious temper. I dare say you've not had many lessons in manners yet. Manners aren't taught in lessons. Lessons teach you to do things like sums and, and things like that. Can you do addition? What is one and one and one and one and one and one and one? I don't know. I lost count. Hmm. She can't do addition. Can you do subtraction? What is nine from eight? Nine from eight? Oh, well, I could take eight from nine, but nine... nine... She can't do subtraction. Can you do division? Divide a loaf by a knife. 
What is the answer to that? Well, I suppose it would be... Bread and butter. Take a bone from a dog. What remains? Well, the bone wouldn't remain, of course, if I took it. And the dog wouldn't remain. It would come to bite me. And I'm sure I wouldn't remain. Then you think nothing would remain? <laughs> yes, I think that is the answer. Wrong as usual. The dog's temper would remain. Oh, but I don't see how you could possibly get that. The, the dog would lose his temper, wouldn't he? Well, perhaps it would. Then if the dog went away, the temper would remain. Oh, no, not if they went different ways. I say, can you do some? I can do additions, if you give me time. But I can't do subtractions under any circumstances. And I don't suppose you know your ABCs, do you? I certainly... Uh, I'm asking questions. How do you make bread? Oh, I know that. You take some flour. And where do you pick the flour? Oh, it isn't picked at all. It's ground. Oh! Oh, good gracious! The White Queen has fallen asleep. Lend her your nightcap and sing her a lullaby. But I haven't a nightcap. Uh, and what's the good of singing her to sleep when she's already gone to sleep? Oh, uh, sing me a lullaby. I'm getting sleepy too. Oh, dear. Now what am I to do? Oh, do wake up, you heavy things. Oh, dear. Mr. Ray Noble and orchestra are going to play for your entertainment. Ray, what have you chosen for their majesties? Oh, well, Gertie, for this occasion I've committed an assault for which I hope to be forgiven on two well-known Scottish melodies. Charlie is my darling and Bonnie Mary of Argyle. Very well. <laughs> Thank you. 
Marion Lee, who won the most discussed role of all time, that of Scarlett O'Hara, joins forces with the distinguished British actor Mr. Basil Rathbone in their radio version of two famous love poems, one by Robert Browning, the other by his wife, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Let's contend no more, love, strive nor weep. All be as before, love, only sleep. Be a god and hold me with a charm. Be a man and fold me with thine arm. Teach me, only teach, love. As I ought, I will speak thy speech, love. Think thy thought. Meet, if thou require it, both demand. Laying flesh and spirit in thy hands. That shall be tomorrow, not tonight. I must bury sorrow out of sight. Must a little weep, love, foolish me. And so fall asleep, love, loved by thee. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passions put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. To the astonishment of themselves and their friends among the British colony in Hollywood, Sir Cedric Hardwick, Mr. Nigel Bruce and Mr. Aubrey Smith recently discovered themselves to be the proud possessors of an extraordinary vocal talent which they will now demonstrate. Down in the meadow in a little bitty pool Swam three little fishes, and a mamma fishy too. Swim, said the mamma fishy, swim if you can. And they swam and they swam all over the dam. Boop, boop, dittum, dottum, wottum, shoo. Boop, boop, dittum, dottum, wottum, shoo. Boop, boop, dittum, dottum, wottum, shoo. And they swam and they swam all over the dam. Sir Cedric Hart. Stop, said the mama fishy, or you will get lost. But the three little fishes didn't want to be bossed. So the three little fishes went off on a spree, and they swam, and they swam right out of the sea. Boop, boop, dittum, dottum, bottom, chew. Boop, boop, dittum, dittum, bottom, chew. Boop, boop, dittum, dittum, bottom, chew. And they swam, and they swam right out of the sea. The Aubrey swam. We yell the little fishes, here's a lot of fun. We'll swim in the sea till the day is done. So they swam and they swam and it was a lark. Till all of a sudden they met a shark. What a shoo! Boop, boop, titum, dotum, what a shoo! Boop, boop, titum, dotum, what a shoo! Till all of a sudden they met a shark. Try to eat a fittest, they look at the fails. And twit as they do, they turn on their tails. And back to the pool in the meadow they swam. And they fam, and they fam right over the dam. Boop, boop, did them down the bottom shoe. Boop, boop, did them down the bottom shoe. Boop, boop, did them down the bottom shoe. And they swam, and they swam right over the Gentlemen, that was a version we have never heard before and probably never will again. Mr. Herbert Marshall has made the long flight from Hollywood, arriving only 15 minutes ago, to appear on this program to their majesties. 
he now stands beside Miss Judith Anderson, who is all the way from Australia. And they will give us the farewell scene from Romeo and Juliet. Wilt thou be gone? It is not yet near day. It was the nightingale and not the lark that pierced the fearful hollow of thine ear. Nightly she sings on yon pomegranate tree. Believe me, love, it was the nightingale. It was the lark, the herald of the morn, no nightingale. Look, love, what envious streaks do lace the severing clouds in yonder east. Night's candles are burnt out, and jock and day stands tipped on the misty mountain tops. I must be gone and live, or stay and die. Yon light is not daylight. I know it. I. It is a meteor that the sun exhales. To be to thee this night a torchbearer, and light thee on thy way to Mantua. Therefore stay yet. Thou needs not to be gone. Let me be ten. Let me be put to death. I am content, so I will have it so. I'll say yon gray is not the morning's eye. Tis not the bell reflex of Cynthia's brow. Nor that is not the lark whose notes do beat the vaulty heaven so high above our heads. I have more care to stay than will to go. Come, death, and welcome. Juliet wills it so. How is my soul? Let's talk. It is not day. It is. It is. High hence. Be gone. Away. It is the lark that sings so out of tune, straining harsh discords and unpleasing shots. Oh, now be gone. More light and light it grows. More light and light. More dark and dark our woes. Farewell. Farewell. One kiss and I'll descend. Art thou gone so, my lord? My love, my friend, I must hear from thee every day in the hour, for in a minute there are many days. Oh, by this count I shall be much in years, ere I again behold my Romeo. Farewell. I will omit no opportunity that may convey my greetings, love, to thee. Oh, thinkst thou we shall ever meet again? I doubt it not. And all these woes shall serve for sweet discourses in our time to come. Oh, God, I have an ill-divining soul. Methinks I see thee, now thou art so low, as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou lookst pale. And trust me, love, in my eyes so do you. Dry sorrow drinks our blood. Adieu, adieu. Oh, fortune, fortune, all men call thee fickle. If thou art fickle, what dost thou with him that is renowned for faith? Be fickle, fortune, for then, I hope, thou wilt not keep him long, but send him back. Turn and turn about is proverbially fair play. May I introduce our master of ceremonies, Miss Gertrude Lawrence. In the medley of the song she has made famous, Ray Noble and orchestra with Miss Gertrude Lawrence. Oh, Limehouse Kid, oh, 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 Limehouse Kid, going the way that the rest of them did. Poor broken blossom and nobody's child. Limehouse blues, I've a real limehouse blues. Learn from the chinkies, those sad china blues. Wings on my fingers and tears for a crown. That is a story of old china town. Are you? And I was meant for you Together 
Back to Hollywood and three more charming and talented people. Mr. Brian Ahern reads for us Rupert Brooke's poem, A Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by the sons of home. And think this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. Miss Madeline Carroll in the famous toast from Noel Coward's Cavalcade. First of all, my dear, I drink to you, loyal and loving always. Now then, let's couple the future of England with the past of England, the glories and victories and triumphs that are over, and the sorrows that are over too. Let's drink to our sons who made part of the pattern, and to our hearts that died with them. Let's drink to the spirit of gallantry and courage that made a strange heaven out of unbelievable hell. And let's drink to the hope that one day this country of ours, which we love so much, will find dignity and greatness and peace again. 
That was the toast, or rather the prayer of Cavalcade. And when all other memories of this historic visit have faded, the world will remember a gracious royal couple who, by their untiring efforts and genuine friendliness, have become symbols of peace and ambassadors of goodwill. And Mr. Ronald Coleman now gives us a famous passage from Shakespeare's Henry V. On the eve of battle, the Earl of Westmoreland to King Henry V. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cast. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made. And crowns for convoy put into his purse. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, Harry the King, Bedford, and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. And Crispian, Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap, whiles any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. In farewell, I have been asked by those who have had the honor and good fortune to take part in this program and by many, many others who by virtue of time were unable to, to wish their majesties bon voyage and the pious prayer that they will always be remembered by their king and queen as men and women who in good times or bad times are loyal and grateful subjects. Thank you very much, Miss Lawrence. And thank you, Mr. George M. Cohan. Ladies and gentlemen, May I introduce Mr. George M. Cohan, leading figure of the American theater and composer of the justly famous Over There, Mr. Cohan. Well, thank you again, Miss Lawrence, and your fellow countrymen who have participated in this tribute. Speaking as an American and as a representative of the American theater, may I, may I propose a toast to the health of His Majesty King George the, the Sixth. And God bless the Queen. A toast. To a fine young man, to a very lovely lady, to as charming a couple as ever graced these shores. Your visit here has brought happiness to millions of Americans and has tightened the bond of friendship between our two great nations. The men and women of the American theater join their English cousins in a salute to their fine young king, their lovely queen. Bon voyage, your majesties. God bless you both.
Sir Cedric Hardwick, and a toast to President and Mrs. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I speak for my fellow artists and countrymen as I propose a toast to the President and the First Lady of the United States of America, Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We owe a great debt of gratitude to this country where we have been received so generously, courteously, and above all, so humanly. It has been said that the kinship of the arts is more international in scope than any other. It engenders a warm feeling round my heart to hear stories from fellow artists, Americans who are now working in England, of the similar hospitality being accorded them by Englishmen. It makes us feel that the brotherhood of man is not just a theory for idealists to talk about after all. To the American public who has liked us, and to our neighbors, friends, and acquaintances for their genuine hospitality, we feel deeply grateful. just heard a tribute by British stage and screen stars to their sovereigns, the King and Queen of Great Britain. We wish to thank Mr. Frederick Lonsdale, Mr. Roland Lee, and Miss Rady Harris for their assistance in the preparation of this tribute. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. EC Radio-Canada, this is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs>